It's a term that the Buddha often yokes with the phrase, the noble ones. And that's people of integrity. A large part of the training is learning how to develop integrity. It's not just learning a few ideas or learning a few protocols. It's a quality of the heart, a quality of your behavior, a quality of the character. That's what a lot of the training is all about. There's one passage where he talks about seven qualities of a person of integrity. And of the seven qualities, two have to do with things that you can learn from books or things that you can learn from listening. But the other five have to do with things you can pick up only by being around people of integrity. The first two are knowledge of the Dharma and knowledge of the meaning of the Dharma. You can learn the Dharma by listening, you can learn it by reading, and a good part of the meaning you can pick up by trying to figure things out. Reading one sutta and then reading another one, comparing what they have to say, trying to get a sense of what the Buddha meant when he was talking about, say, suffering or emptiness or any of those big terms that play such a huge role in the way he taught. But the other five qualities you can't learn from books at all. The first is having a sense of yourself, where your weaknesses are, where you can trust yourself, where you can't trust yourself, where your strengths are. Where you need to work on yourself. You can look in the whole library of books. You can look at the library of Babel, and you would never find that kind of knowledge. You have to look at yourself in action, and you also have to be around people of integrity so you get a sense of where you measure up and how they see where you measure up. It's not just a matter of your own opinion. You have to. Listen to their opinion. Listen to their standards, which is why the Buddha put so much emphasis on choosing a teacher. You want a teacher who has high standards and holds to them. But this sense of your own strengths and weaknesses, and particularly this issue of where you can trust yourself and where you can't, that takes a lot of time and sensitivity. To develop. As the Buddha said, you have to be very observant and have to watch for a long time to gain this kind of knowledge. Another aspect of a person of integrity's knowledge is having a sense of time and place. And again, you can learn this only by being in lots of different times and lots of different places and being around someone who is sensitive to time and place to see how that person deals with these issues. When's the time to speak? When's the time not to speak? When's the time to act? When's the time not to act? That's something you can pick up only by being around someone who has that kind of sensitivity. And it requires that you be sensitive too, open to that person's influence. And at the same time, learning how to close yourself off to the influence of people who don't have that sense. Another knowledge of a person of integrity is having a sense of enough. How much is enough sleep? How much is enough food? How much is enough talk? Getting a sense of what's too little, what's too much. 
and you can extend this into all the areas of your life. And again, you can pick this up only by being around other people who have a sense of enough. You get into some areas of society where the values are really, really strange as to what constitutes enough. You hear about politicians who seem to be honest enough when you, when you vote for them, and then they get into a different circle of friends or a different circle of society. And what was enough before is suddenly not enough. And they're not honest anymore because they have to scramble in, in their sense of what the society is that they want to inhabit and how they want to compare with those other people. So again, you want to find someone who has a really clear sense of what's enough and what's not enough based on the Buddhist teachings on that reflection of the requisites. How much food is really enough? How much clothing? How much shelter? How much medicine? Another aspect of knowledge is having a sense of groups of people, how you behave, say. The Buddha says how you behave around Brahmins, how you behave around noble warriors. And here it's how you behave around people of upper class, people of lower class, people with a lot of education, people with very little education. How do you talk with them? How do you behave with them in a way that you can communicate with them, but not get sucked into whatever weird, weird values they may have? So it's not just a matter of being pleasing to them, but it's also a matter of holding to your standards. How do you do that in such a way that you're not cutting off all ties with those people? It's a delicate kind of thing. And again, you want to be around this sort of person who has that kind of sense. And then finally, there's a sense of how to judge people. And the standards the Buddha has, you judge people by, or to what extent are they really sincere in wanting to learn the Dharma? To what extent, once they've learned the Dharma, are they sincere in trying to understand it? Once they understand it on that level, to what extent are they trying to apply it to their lives? Those are the areas where you, try to, where you judge people. You don't judge them by their race, you don't judge them by their occupation, you don't judge them by their age. The whole point of this, of course, is that the standards that you use to judge other people are the ones you want to ju use to judge yourself. To what extent are you sincerely interested in the Dharma, sincerely interested in putting it into practice? And again, these are the kinds of values that you pick up by being around people who exemplify them, people who are people of integrity. This is one of the reasons why the relationship that the Buddha prescribed for a teacher and a student is one of an apprenticeship. Not the word andewasika, which they use for being the student of a mentor, is actually the same word for apprentice. And you look at the various protocols of the, appre the, the apprentice, of the student in relationship the preceptor in relationship to the matter. And it's very much an apprentice kind of relationship. You live together. In fact, that's the word for the student who lives with the preceptor. You live with your preceptor. Spend a lot of time with the preceptor. Regard the preceptor as your father. The preceptor is supposed to regard you as the son. And you really look after each other. When the preceptor is sick, the, you look after the preceptor. When you're sick, the preceptor looks after you. You learn to get sensitive to the preceptor's needs. Because again, it's not just a matter of picking up verbal knowledge from the preceptor. You want to gain a sense of that person. What does this person learn from the training when he was apprenticed? What kind of qualities did he pick up? I don't know if I can exemplify all the qualities that, say, John Fung exemplified. But one in particular that I really felt comfortable with and really admired him for was his 
solidity in the face of a lot of antagonism. Pressures from the local people to drop this rule, drop that rule, play favorites this way. No, that he wouldn't. He was solid across the board. And if that meant being unpopular, that was perfectly fine with him. It was once when he was going to choose the treasurer for the, the monastery. And he finally spotted someone he felt he could trust. But just to make sure, he asked the guy a question. It was an interesting, interesting question. He said, which would you prefer, to be popular or to be wealthy? And the treasurer and the, the guy said, I'd rather be wealthy because if you have money, you can buy popularity. And John Fung liked the answer. Take that back and think about it for a while. When you're dealing with someone who's caring for the money of the monastery, you don't want someone who's concerned about being popular. You to give in to pressure one way or another. And sure enough, I saw the treasurer have to stand up to a lot of pressure, and he did. So learning the Dharma is not just a matter of reading the books and understanding the words in the books. It's picking up certain habits of observing, or certain habits of walking, certain habits of looking, talking. Everything you do is part of the training. Which is why the Dharma is not so much something you find in books, it's a quality of the heart that you can absorb over time by being observant. This is something that's lost nowadays. Everyone thinks they can read the Dharma books. And I was just reading recently someone saying, well, as we all know, meaning is a construct, meaning is something you create, so everybody has the freedom to read whatever meaning they want out of the text. Nobody can say that anyone else is wrong. So it's just something to be creative about. Well, that wasn't the Buddha's purpose in teaching. His purpose in teaching was to lay out the steps, what's required to put an end to suffering. So the texts are there within a context. The teachings of the Dharma, the rules of the Vinaya are all in this context of the apprenticeship, picking up qualities of the heart, picking up a sense of values. Because after all, the whole idea of putting end to suffering is a very strong statement of values right there, that this is the important issue in life. When the Buddha was talking about the Four Noble Truths, he wasn't just telling us information about the Four Noble Truths. He was asserting a value that this is the most important way of looking at things. This is the most important goal you can set for yourself, is to put an end to suffering. So to understand him, you have to not only understand the words that he uses to describe suffering and the cause and the end and the path to its cessation, you have to understand why it's important, why he gives priority to this. And in the past, when people were simply reading the text, they oh, said, this is a very selfish, very narrow approach to spiritual life. But then my experience of going to Thailand and meeting with the Ajahns is these were not selfish and narrow people. They really had something special. So there's that aspect of the Dharma that you can pick up only by being around people who've trained themselves in the Dharma, been trained by their, their teachers who have been willing to apprentice themselves, to pick up the values. In the past, this aspect was so important, not just in the area of the Dharma, but in terms of other skills as well. There are a lot of old skills that used to be practiced in Thailand that have died because the teachers didn't see anyone worthy of passing them on to. And when they talk about worthy of passing them on, it was had to do with the character of the student. I knew one woman in, in Bangkok. She'd been born in the palace. Her father had played a musical instrument for Robert the VI. In fact, he was the, the head musician of the, the royal orchestra. 
composed of xylophones and gongs and the other Thai instruments. And so this woman was born there in the palace, spent her childhood, part of which was learned, which was just spent learning how to cook. And she was a really good cook. And even after she left the palace and had to make a living on her own after her husband died, she developed a really, really good reputation as a cook. In fact, other women came to, to study with her. And she told me one time, this one woman in particular was really wanting to study how to cook with her. And her response was, I don't want to teach this woman. She's too flighty. You may not think that flightiness has anything to do with cooking, but it was her attitude that she had something really valuable and she didn't want to spend her time training someone who she didn't think had the character to be a good cook. As far as I know, she ended up teaching only three other people how to cook. Her highest praise for me one time was she said, you know, if you were a layperson, I'd teach you how to cook. And I took that as a big compliment. So what we're learning here is not just the words. It's the quality of the heart and the quality of the character. And if you're open to learning that dimension, these are the things you have to look at. Gaining a sense of yourself, gaining a sense of the right time and place, gaining a sense of how much is enough, how much is too little, how much is too much. Gaining a sense of how to, as I say in Thailand, put yourself in different groups of people. Then gaining a sense of how to judge people by their character, so that you start judging yourself by your character. All these qualities go together. And they play a huge part in the training. So it's not just a meditation technique we're learning here, and not just a few statements about the truth. It's learning how to be a true person, a person of integrity, and developing, trying to adopt the, the same standards that the Buddha had. when he defined what a person of integrity was.